Welcome to part two of Is This England's recap of The Impossible Job. Uh, my lovely friend and colleague Nick is going to tell you where we left off. So we left off last time with England snatching a draw in Turkey, um, with Ian Wright coming off the bench to do so. England in a bit of a sorry state still, but they're off to Norway now. Will things get better? Find out. So we're on to the uh, Norway build-up. This is where he actually mms over the uh, physio when he's... It feels like he's giving him a rundown of every player. Um, he's like... Because he says, uh, young Ian Wright, obviously no issues with him. He played 15 minutes. Yeah, there was no like need that. for that at no all. No need for that. But, but yeah. this is this is intercut with the physio. Oh, my God. This is the physio rubbing some of the players, but you can't tell what he's rubbing. It, it looks like. So, so they're talking, and then you just get shots of what look... It looks like something... Like outtake real footage from a butcher's like promotional video or something like yeah. that. It looks like somebody's preparing meat. And why this is there's parts of this documentary where I think they're quite experimental. <laughs> I think the Attenborough stuff earlier, the um we'll get to some some other bits, but this whose idea was that? What does it add? Well the thing is though, it wouldn't if it was just like him talking about the players and their injuries and it's the same one shot, you could yeah. maybe say it, but it's just the fact that you just get this kneading of people's backs like like he's doing some like pottery. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's it's like if they're talking about Alan Shearer's got a, an injured ankle or something like yeah. that, and then you see Alan Shearer like you know, and you know it's out of because you can see his full body. Yeah, but this is close-ups of backs being rubbed that are just interspersed. I don't know why they did it. I think no. that's some kid who's who doesn't want to do a documentary about football and wants to do it about like I don't know, <laughs> like adult cinema. Basically, yeah. it's yeah, it's very kind of raunchy that bit, isn't it? <laughs> um, it it kind of cuts out of that, uh, and it talks about um, it's Taylor then talking about Gaza saying he needs to look after himself and his diet and how he refuels himself. Immediately, it cuts to Gaza eating like the, like a camel, <laughs> and uh, and he just goes, "Oh, give me a Remy light." I know, yeah. Oh, that's a, that, that's a cigarette, right? No, as in like a Remy, you know, for like, like a Rennie kind of thing. Oh. For like, for like indigestion and stuff, because he's clearly just sat there eating whatever they're giving him, which at that point can't be good for him still. Yeah, um, I can't really, we've we've had the Gascoigne chat, but yeah, he, yeah. he's just been an absolute menace. And there's there's yet again more talk about the the media from Taylor and, and just just the, the, the whole storm that surrounds him. But yeah, there's a part now, so we get to the Norway game and they kind of start dropping bits of the Norway game in before it started. And I think this is probably the best bit of the documentary, which Ooh. I I must have rewound this about four or five times when it was going on. I've got my own favourite bit and it's not this book. Oh, yeah. So I think maybe we, I think I'll never be able to do the justice of the whole thing, but there's a, so basically he says that I'll be making changes for the Norway game uh, as they're a methodical team with a very methodical manager. They'll be expecting us to play one way, but for this game, I will be changing formation. We'll be playing with three at the back, pushing people forward to attack them. And with Ferdinand sharing them up front, I expect us to cause a lot of problems. He reads it out as if it's like a statement to the press, like he's been disgraced or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's just like very somber. And he's like, yes, I've got all the answers here. Um, it's a very calm and well thought out. And then he continues with his thoughts on Gascoigne. There's been speculation about Gascoigne uh, playing or not. He's always been playing in my mind because whether he's 13 stone or 10 stone, the Norwegian players are in awe of him. Fucking Paul, come on! Hey! Fucking hit the space in there! Don't blame him! No. It's got to be it. It's just in there for them twice! Hey, Paul! <laughs> They're in awe of him, <laughs> and, and just him. The, the comic timing, timing again there. Oh, God. <laughs> Honestly, I had to stop this numerous times and just go back because I was dying with laughter. In my notes, I did actually put fucking Paul, come on, best <laughs> best bit so far. So I do agree with you to a point. Um, yeah, and and so we, we're kind of get, <laughs> we're getting into the Norway game now, big game. Um, Chris Woods, Lee Dixon, Gary Pallister, Carlton Palmer, Des Walker, Tony Adams. I feel like I've been saying defenders for about 45 minutes I there. Know, yeah. So Tony Adams, David Platt, captain, Paul Gascoigne, Les Ferdinand, Teddy Sheringham and Lee Sharp with um, 
Ian Wright and Nigel Clough, two of it's, the substitutes. So, so immediately this game, he's changed the tactics. He's kind of doing, this is what I'm going to do. I'm big football manager. I know about tactics. I'm going to try and do something differently. We don't even get to the tactics yet because immediately the camera angle on this is just crazy. <laughs> so the camera angle looks like it's been filmed by his toes. Yeah, yeah. And so it's Taylor... Right up the... Right it's, up the nose. It's ridiculous. There's one point that Taylor stands up and you can see up his sleeve jacket. <laughs> it's just so intrusive. I mean, the cameraman has got to be lying on the floor filming Taylor at this point. So like, on his back or on his front, because there's a bit where Taylor gets up and starts walking <laughs> and he's pretty much stepped over the cameraman. <laughs> it's like he's not there. Or he doesn't know he's being filmed. Like it's, yeah, not, oh. it's not even, And it's not like a hard, steady cam that's there. It's being moved along as right. well. Yeah, of course, yeah. I, I think... Um, what you see from that camera angle is interesting. Taylor, you've said he's gone in with a, oh, I'm confident. This yeah. is our tactics. This is the plan. He looks nervous. His hands are fidgeting. Mm. Um, obviously, it's a big game. The other coaches look nervous as well. Yeah, no, no it doesn't look happy here. Um, do you want to talk about the other coaches? Yeah, so you've got uh, Phil Neal and uh, Laurie McMenemy. So for a lot of it, I think, again, to reference Mike Bassett, you can kind of see where they took some of this stuff because Laurie McMenemy's always got a suit on. I'm not really sure why he's Power play. T Taylor's in a track suit at this point and then Mc McMenemy's wearing a, a suit. Well, in, in this one, most of the time he is in the track suit. For this exact part here, he's got a suit on for oh, some reason. But it, it's Phil Neal who's got the track suit on. Yeah. But throughout the whole thing, Phil Neal, Phil Neal is always in a track suit. Taylor usually is. But McMenemy is just like, well, this is what I wore to the ground. I, I think, yeah, I think that, I don't know what they're adding. I mean, he obviously trusts them, but there's a point where, I don't know if it's in this game or another game, where England concede a goal and their reaction is to just go, all of you have a run to the subs bench. Like, yeah. what are you going to just bring everyone on? It's not, this isn't Sven. You can't bring 11 players on. And, and, and as well, Phil Neal is just mimicking Taylor's body language throughout some of this. So there's there's a bit as well. I think they, I think it's the first goal they concede. Well, yeah. And both of them immediately just cross their arms. And it's... I don't know if that's kind of like a nervous thing. I don't know if it's about their relationship with each other or one of them kind of, they really respect each other in the way they do this, but immediately it just looks weird. So we kind of did a little bit of a spoiler there. The, the pressure's being ramped up. Taylor's getting agitated with how they're playing. He's swearing a lot, yeah. which, which you don't really see him doing apart from the infamous fucking Paul. Yeah. But he's effing and jeffing all over the place here, <laughs> much like you'd imagine like a 90s manager would. But Taylor, he never, I never felt like that was him. Yeah, he has a, he has a goal at one of the uh, the England defenders who um, totally oh, mess up a long pass. <laughs> it's, it's it's painful to watch. So the ball is kind of in the right back position. I can't quite tell if it's the the, um, the centre half or the right back, but whoever it is, they hold on to the ball for too long. And Taylor is pretty much shouting at them to no, don't get rid of it yet because they've taken too long. And he just pumps the ball forward and he shouts something like, "You can't wait that long and expect to deliver quality." Which yeah. I thought was quite an interesting idea, actually, because he's waited so long. He's got all these different ideas in his head. He's just like, uh, don't know what to do with it. And he's just pumped it forward. Right. So the quality has got to come from the quick thinking and the intuition. Yeah, because he's waited on it for too long. He's got too many ideas. So he's not really going to commit to something. Because I think Taylor was all about getting the ball up the pitch quickly into like the, I think he's called it something like the uh, space of maximum opportunity or something he used to call it. <laughs> it sounds like a, a self-help book. I know. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's and not, not long after that. I mean... The goal. Well, yeah, and they haven't got Paul Ince helping them out either here. So, yeah, sure. um, and, and and it's the went to sleep, isn't it? Come on, Dad, Come, Come on, Paul. Dad, Come on, Paul. The referee. Watch it. Watch he's taking it. Stand up, stand up. That's in. Went to fucking sleep, didn't we? Hey, hey, we went to fucking sleep, though, didn't we? Hey, how can you go to sleep and turn your back like that? Hey, hey. Yeah, they, a, I mean, they really did. Um, yeah, exactly. Oh. They're, they're not paying attention whatsoever. And yeah, Taylor and Neil, this is where they both kind of uh, cross their arms at the same time as well. He's, he, he keeps dropping A, doesn't he? He's like, hey, went to sleep, eh? <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Went to sleep, eh? <laughs> just like, oh God! Like the the, the other guys, the, the other manager, are kind of scared to interact with him. But I think they're both hoping that a isn't directly meant for them. Yeah, like it's their fault or something. Like yeah. you should have told them not to do that. 
England get a free kick, uh, wide left of the goal, a big build up for this because we're wanting that quality from Gascoigne. Yeah, and as we said previously, his, his set piece delivery is absolutely awful. He just <laughs> just gets cut out, and Phil Neal goes, "That's what it's in the fucking side for." <laughs> so me, they're knowing, like again, can't can't take him off because he's supposed to be good with this, but he's not performing. And I mean, just taking that statement at face value, though, we've had we've heard them complain about Gascoigne being an animal who needs to be allowed to run free. Yeah, so yeah. what? he's not in the side for set, to take set pieces, is he? He should, he should be having more of an influence over the game but than just is, taking is, set is pieces. Is that something about the technical deficiencies of this England team, though? 100%. Where you kind of say, if, you know, I never thought he was like a great, great set piece taker or something like that, but if he's in the side and that he's the best at it and clearly this isn't working and they're not even been able to change it as the tournament's gone on at the qualifying rounds. Well, it gets worse. It yeah. goes down to 2-0. At this point... I, I wasn't aware of this game specifically, and I was—I didn't know what the result would be. Mm. I was actually thinking, I was scared. I was—I was, this is going to be a five-nil Norway. I, it, it, watching it, it felt like the lowest England moment ever in terms of quality. <laughs> Not like the most soul-destroying, because when I think when you get to a higher stage, the losses hurt yeah, more. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was watching it. I was like, oh my god. How has it got this bad? So England get the ball high up the pitch. Norway break on them just pretty much immediately. Play it down the left-hand side and it's just stroked in at the near post by um, by the Norway player. And Taylor t immediately turns around and goes, now this is a test. Well, another, like I said, I think he likes his back to the wall. Yeah. He, he, he sounded like he was, like imagine saying, now this is a test. Like, no, this, yeah. he emphasises the A. Now this is a test. Yeah, it's, this is, it's like enjoying it. Now this will yeah. test them all, won't it? This will show what they're made of. And and I, I do agree what you say when it's like the bigger the challenge, the maybe the more he, he feels he has to respond to it. Yeah. Um, and it, well, to get into the tactics now, they know they need to make a change. Um, and again, it's all centered around Gascoigne. Yeah. So the, his words are, do we actually just get in, get into that back four and maybe let's just see if Gascoigne can get him into the attacking third. He's, again, he's kind of half asking half kind of like, is this a good idea? So, in this game, he's playing David Platt, Paul Gascoigne as a midfield too. So Taylor's commented in the previous game where they were looking for a goal. If Platt's going to kind of sit, then that means that he's, that's not the best of his abilities. So playing him in a two is not great. But Paul Ince is clearly out of the game. So we haven't got someone there. And so he changes to a back four. Well, he brings on Nigel Nigel Clough and, and he's um, like, he's he looks confused because he's being told He's just, he's just basically going, okay, you, you're coming on and this is where Gascoigne's playing and yeah. Gascoigne's going to be doing this and you, Gascoigne's going to be there. And I feel like if I was Nigel at that point, I'd be going, well, what do you want me to do? Yeah, because he, he, he pretty much says that and he's just telling where Gazza should play. So at this point, he's got David Platt, Gazza, Clough, Wright and Ferdinand all playing on the pitch at the minute. You've got Carlton Palmer in the middle, in the middle, so he's happy there, so there's no problem there. Yeah. <laughs> but there's there's no width whatsoever. It's just, yeah, and then they just keep going. So they've made their subs and they go, oh, Gazza looks knackered, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, well, bring him off, then I know it's going to, like, kick off. But in reality, if you're not happy with the team here, and I think it's that fear of taking him off, but by not doing the thing that he's afraid of, he's making it way worse for himself. Yeah, uh, it's not a good result, is it? It's a it's a 2-0 loss. Um, and um, Taylor comments that he didn't even give the players the satisfaction of a rollicking. No. And this then goes into one of the strangest parts of the my favorite thing. My favourite <laughs> bit. Um, it, what what is this? this? This is, again, this is the most experimental. This is like putting, it's it's like putting out an album of pop songs, three minute pop songs, and then in the middle, you've got a 17 minute so, death e metal. E explain jam. what this is then. So it's a, it's allegedly uh, Graham Taylor re-watching the Norway game. Yeah. Um, except he's doing it in like some Twin Peaks setting. <laughs> he sat there in, in pitch black with these red, these red lights going on around him, like on his own, in the dark, on this weird thrown chair that he's got. and a, In his front room, apparently. And you've got like that, mm, like the Twin Peaks sort yeah. of, of, of deaf music going on. I, I laughed so much at this. Uh, you, I think you said what, that he's, uh, then we, we kind of see inside his brain. Right? Is, this, is this even that bit? I think there's a bit later when it comes to his brain. I think this is just, this is the build-up, I think. No, you, you're right. 
<laughs> so it's yeah, no, you are right. It's full Twin Peaks at the moment. He's sat in the in the room. This is season one. It's not it's, really made a lot of sense yet, but yeah. we, we're gonna we're gonna kind of go on to it. And he he actually says, on reflection, having made those changes, I didn't give myself enough time to work with the team on the training pitch, and they didn't perform as well. Well, which he, is which is fair. He, oh God, there is the, this this post Norway pre inside his head. And the English, <laughs> it, there's so many funny bits. So there's a bit where he's on a plane, uh, presumably going back to England, um, and the voiceover calls him. It's, it's like at this point, Taylor is a lonely, vulnerable figure <laughs> as he sits on a plane on his own, sipping a glass of water. I think he's holding the glass of water with two hands, and he's wearing a bib. And it's like, what the? Heck? Why is he looking so pathetic? And they say he's travel. Oh, he's not going to England. He's travelling to Spain for an uncomfortable meeting. Yeah, so he's going to go and meet David Platt here. Yeah, no, he's talking in the car. <laughs> it's like he's like he's a. <laughs> It's like he's a mad king who can just demand whatever he wants. He's going, I shall bring back Stuart Pearson to the squad and also I shall make him captain. <laughs> it's like he's dead. Yeah. It's like the way he's talking about it. Oh, whatever happened to Stuart Pearce? Like, what happened? Like, was he injured for like most of this qualifying campaign? I know that the voiceover told us, but how is he only just back fit now for oh, a man. year? So funny. It's like, I shall have 14 dusky maidens. Yeah. I shall have a banquet and I shall bring Stuart Pearce <laughs> back into the England and, squad. And, and he'll be captain. And I shall also make him captain. See yeah. that it be done. Yeah. Um, and then he, he, oh my God. And he goes to meet David Platt to tell him that he's, <gasps> he's taking the armband off him. And he's looking at him like a girl in the fifties would look at Elvis in one of the movies. Yeah, he's like yeah. doting over him while telling him, I'm taking the captaincy from you. And and the thing is as well, he's also saying, oh, uh, also, also with this, you know, you know, the, what the press are going to say and all this other kind of stuff around it. You know, the reason I'm doing this, I want to give it to Stuart and, you know, David Platt says, oh, I was happy to have it, but, you know, I don't mind not having it anymore. I imagine he just wants to get away from this absolute mess that is England and not be given yeah. any more blame. He doesn't He doesn't look bothered David, at all. David Platt does well in this qualifying, by the way. He's probably England's best player. He is scoring all the while for England. Yeah. He's got himself a move to Italy as well. He's playing in Sampdoria and you just think... You're, well, it's that, get captain, lost a bit. it's that captain thing again, isn't it? Of going, all right, I need, I need to pin this change on somebody. And then Graham Taylor goes to prison. Yeah, Graham Taylor visits a prison at this point. I did of all the places I expected him to go. I did not. So in this Polk's Norway game, he's been in an episode of Twin Peaks. <laughs> He's been a lonely, vulnerable man on a plane sipping water with a bib. Also, a bit we've missed out, he's gone to the America and he's been derised over there as well. Oh, God, yeah, they'd lost in a friendly to America, right? So, yeah, so basically, England, in prep for the 94 World Cup, they went to America to play uh, the uh, it's America's Cup kind of friendly tournament. So they played Germany, they played Brazil, and they played USA. Now, England lost to America. Now, America aren't this great team as we think of them now where they're always at world cups and they really light them up and they're you know they're if they're not a world cup now i find it's really weird but yeah, back yeah, then they were true. hosting him and they really didn't do anything in the world cup i think they beat england in the 50s but it wasn't yeah. like a big thing but they go and lose over there and yeah it's just it's seen as one of the worst performances of the 90s basically yeah, that they, game they're calling for his head big time at this point i think it's even at the airport you hear someone saying oh but you know he's he could be gone i mean england drew with brazil they they lost to germany over in that tournament and you just think what on earth is this and yeah so he's he's going to prison yeah. um i mean right. I, I mean again it says a lot about him yeah he comes back from he comes back from spain visiting david platt on this pre-season tour and he's clearly got this pre-existing commitment that he said he'd go go to prison to speak to some of the inmates and do a bit of um social care which is again i yeah, think reflects well I, on it, him. It, it does reflect well on him it's just it, it coming at this point in the documentary after this it just it's gone really psychedelic in the last five minutes and then he's in a prison and to be honest i think he has a lovely day out I think he's just yeah glad he's to glad be out, to be not glad in, to be out of the way. I mean, not it, footballers. I mean, it doesn't start well immediately at security. The, the guard says, "Is Gaza playing the next game?" I know. Yeah, he's like, "Oh, you'll have to wait and see." It's I like he, he, he's going to be playing, isn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's, he he talks about football. Uh, there's quite a lot of like intelligent questions that are that are thrown his way. I thought uh, one thing that was really interesting that what he said was that. Um, he says we, we we play too much football in yeah. this country at the moment, and that's a big problem. Now that has surely gone at least 
10 times worse. And, yeah. and it all, since COVID, probably about 20 times. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing thing, isn't it, with football? Where are we playing too much of it? You know, is it? What would we do with the players? And obviously with things like COVID, we've seen games called off recently with with this kind of thing. And we could just be having this exact same conversation today. But Taylor does say, yeah, we play too much football in this country. And also we burn players out at a younger age. You look at someone like Wayne Rooney, by the time he was 28, 29, really, he, he kind of was in his... In reality, his body he was in his mid thirties, and when he actually got to his thirties, he was just like, "I need to play midfield, else I can't do anything now." Have He's you got Owen as well? Have you ever watched The Last Dance? Uh, yes, I, that was what eye opening to me. Just I, I, I was watching. Well, I think because there's so much travel, mm. uh, especially in America, and I was like, "God, they're just being run into the ground." Yeah, and, yeah. and I think Harry Kane made a reference to it recently as well, or Jordan Henderson. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, saying I that players' well being is not being considered at all. I mean, to me. Scrap some of the cups and and international friendlies. I mean, we 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 did our first podcast episode about an international friendly, so they can be great. But there, but there's a reason that's remembered as being there's a reason that's remembered. Full stop. Because friendlies are a lot more. You know, they happen and they just kind of wash over you really these days. I mean, I do think the Nations League has kind of helped a bit because it's given games a bit of a purpose and and teams who struggle to qualify for tournaments are given a bit of a chance to like. Um, like Scotland, I know had a really good Nations League, and it put them in good stead to qualify for the Euros. But yeah, it's, it's just a constant conversation, unfortunately, isn't it? Uh, Taylor comments that he, he might like to stay in prison, uh, particularly if, if they lose the upcoming game against Poland. Yeah, that, that's a really nice bit, but there's some genuine worry in there, isn't there as well? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think he'd be made for prison. Um, mm. uh, a guard asks him. So we're back to the press now. Yeah, uh, not not the. Um, Ralph Ranick, Thomas Tuchel, uh, press the the journalists. Yeah. Um, a guard asks about uh, the tabloid press relationship with Taylor, and he says he dislikes when people make up stories. He does, he does go back to that, doesn't he? It, it's, I think he respects that they have a job to do and ask questions, but he hates and fairly enough false st- stories. Yeah, I think that was another point where he, again he mentioned where he said that though they made he made he made Gaza go out and actually give his. You know, talks to the press which is just absolutely nothing um he also says something really interesting about team selection so he says with every one of my team selection there's not only a risk but a responsibility because my teams have to play your selections never carry that risk and never carry that responsibility i thought that was really well put is he meaning journalists when you make up this idealized team so you can put 11 players out on that pitch on your on paper yeah and you you've got that right so you'll never not get that right if it's a different team to me but when i pick a team it's got to play actually we saw so much of that at euro 2020 mm. the, the the safe gate the the oh my god every step of the way it was like he's, he's been found out with his team selection mm. and every step of the way he proved people wrong except the final we won't talk about true yeah, but um, but again, to get all that way when you've apparently been wrong all the time, it's just not true, is it? Yeah, like just it was the Grealish thing that was massive, wasn't it? Uh, you even had things like Mount going out and coming back in, and and it's true, like every it's the same thing you get on social media all the time now. Oh, this is ridiculous. Why is he playing this player? Why is he doing this? And then by the end of the game, it's it, a lot of the time it does come round. I think he's um he's very Safegate is very conscious of burnout as well in the tournament situation. So yeah. it, it you know it it's in theory not a lot of games seven or eight whoever it is to get to a final and win but um a lot can happen and and the emotional side of it as well as the physical because you're, you're going to put everything into it yeah so he, he switches players around I, I don't even think that's an, a, a, an option for taylor at this point it, it's not he's, he's absolutely back to the wall has to play his best players but, but i don't think taylor helps himself throughout this as well so there's, there's there's a bit where if you think back to italia 90 and you think of that team that played back then so you've got people like um uh, John Barnes, who obviously played, but then you've got Chris Waddle, who he just never picks, and he goes to off him to play in Marseille, and he does really well. I don't think he plays Paul Parker until like the last game. And I'm not saying Paul Parker is like a really you know, vital person, but I think he plays like three or four different right backs during the qualifying tournament, and he gets rid of Peter Beardsley, who'd been playing well, so he rarely even played under him there. Lineker's kind of at the end of his career as well, so you've got again all these players that aren't quite at their peak, but he just gets rid of a few of them maybe a bit too quickly. Yeah, he's he's not perfect, is he? Like he's, we've said a few times now that he's um he doesn't help himself in cert- in certain ways. But uh, I, I, I guess he's just trying to have be his own man and and shut out all the noise around him and do what he wants. Well, we can we can see seeing what he's thinking because we're going into his head now. <laughs> oh God! And we've just had a run of results that has seemed to upset my two people in the country, and, and consequently, 
You know, I think I'm as well staying in here with you fellas, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Particularly if we lose against uh, Poland. This is crazy. This is the the most. What is this? It's it's yeah. it's all slum. You can hear it's going. Knock it. <laughs> but it's also sped up really quickly yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, and sped up, and it's it's pure Twin Peaks again. I don't know why slow mo's. Everyone's got big chins, the kind of like melting faces, and then it cuts to the the next morning after, and he looks like he's just not had a wink. So it just cut, <laughs> after this nightmare inside of his head, it cuts to him just standing there, like looking dead into space. And if someone went to him, "You all right?" He would he would go, oh, "I've not had a minute's sleep. I'd I'd, I'd what." Like, Did you record that dream I had? <laughs> <laughs> but also, there's there's bits in there that clearly aren't from the rest of the documentary. So there's a bit where someone's just got a knife in their hands. Yeah. Like, when did someone film that? <laughs> like, I want to see that bit of the documentary that we've clearly missed, where someone's just had a knife and they've gone, well, we'll record that then. Like, they, that's clearly been set up post what, after the documentary, where they go, well, the knives are out for him and that. And it's just... It's so strange. As with Twin Peaks, I, I, I do think the first moment where he's in the chair in that dark room is my favourite. <laughs> this is a little bit too much. It's gone too big. As it's gone too season two. This hasn't yeah, it? again, again, that's a work experience, lad. They're going do this scene, and he's he wants to be Tarantino or something yeah, or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um. Oh, so sad now. I, I I just I hate this bit. Um. So it's pre-game. Uh, we we're, we're we're building up towards the Poland game, which is absolutely massive for England. And he talks about his relationship with his wife and how this circus and negativity and animosity towards him has um, affected that. He says uh, she feels so much hurt about it all, which is really tragic. Yeah, yeah. And again, it just shows that he's obviously bringing this home with him and it's it's affecting him as well and oh yeah, he just, it just makes you feel really bad. I mean, I nearly I nearly cried at one point. He he <laughs> says um cuz he's saying she's so so hurt hurt about it all. Um but I I'm still positive that I can turn this around yeah. and, and I want to do this job. And he goes, but you know, I have, I have problems like everyone, you know, the, just the usual stuff like waking up in the middle of the night and your clothes are completely wet because you've been sweating and, and, and having nightmares. I'm like, that's, that's not, not normal. That's not good. That's not the usual stuff. No, Graham, that's not good. That is it. He, um, he also said he's being interviewed as well. Um, so he says he's been waiting for the Poland game since the Norway result, uh, thinking he's got three months to wait instead of having a bloody good summer. And he says, I've had a miserable, lousy summer waiting for this game to come. So it's really affected him. Yeah. he Because um, he knows that re result is on him as well, because he made the changes. It messed up. Th that could not really be more at his own doorstep. That is a summer ruiner. That is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so he's had to wait three months. And that's that's a, an interesting thing about international management as well. If you if you take it so personally, like he he clearly is, you've got to wait so long to get your shot at redemption, you know. Um, and we'll get to that um, soon enough. But um, he then um, talks about uh, his kind of conversations with Des Walker. Yeah, so he's kind of saying that he's he's going to leave Des Walker out now. So he looks like uh, Gary Palace is going to play with Tony Adams instead because he's switching from the back three and. The way he's talking about it, he's just like he's not. He clearly hasn't wanted to have this conversation with Walker because you know the, the infamous thing with him was that you know you'll never beat Des Walker because he was always so quick and that was what made him such a good footballer. But clearly, from that Overmars running past him, the, the pace is pace, the pace is gone. Is gone. Yeah. Again, he's picking faults at Walker's game that aren't his fault. Again, the passing to John Barnes, I don't think that was even nearly his fault. It's a poor first touch. Maybe it's a bit of overcompensating because the press had been on at Barnes, but. Yeah, it just sounds like it's. He it says every great player comes to an end, and thinks that maybe he's done Walker a favour in kind of leaving him out. I feel in this. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it is what it is and, at this and, point. And it, it, you're not addressing the biggest issue, I don't think, by focusing on Des Walker and Stuart Pearce. And no, like but that. I think throughout the film, he's also you can just hear him go Des, Des, as if yeah. he's trying to like manage him through the game, or he's not happy with him. But yeah, yeah, um, we're we're really building up now. Um, I hate this bit. The Paul Ince's Paul so, boots. Because it's, it's a nice shot, actually, of the yeah. somebody puts a pair of boots down on the floor and then the next one lines up after it and that's more in the foreground. And then Ince's boots. Are they Adidas? They're Adidas, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we've um, Gov written in black pen See, on I one didn't of the know. three stripes. I didn't know he had that on his boots. I thought Governor was just a name that he kind of given himself, and you'd you know you'd talk, heard about when he left, and Ferguson wasn't happy because he'd done that and called him a big time Charlie and things. Well, that he is a big time Charlie, isn't he? Writing Gov on your boots, it's so, and and then he comes in shocking, shocking suit, <laughs> uh, embarrassing really. I, I don't know. I've got I've got a bad. Um, uh, perception of Paul Ince in general, I think is he's, he's he's kind of known as a bit of a knob. I think the I think the problem was is that he never has anybody sticking up for him. A bit like the Michael Owen that we were saying early in terms of he was amazing at Man United, but he left West Ham in bad circumstances because he was pitching in one of their in a Man United kit before he arrived at Man United. He left there because Ferguson said that he didn't think that he was kind of up to it anymore, and he had Skulls and Button and Keen coming through, so why not play them? Yeah. Went to Inter Milan and, and did well there, but he's wanted to come back because of his family, which, you know, good enough reason. But then going to sign for Liverpool and making such a big thing about that. So he's not endeared himself to the club where he was probably at his best. Or he's probably endeared himself to Liverpool fans. Maybe, but I don't even think he's like thought of amazingly there because I think he was there for two years and kind of near the end of that, they mm. moved him on to Middlesbrough. And, and again, maybe something about England because he was in a lot of different teams. And actually in the background of a lot of great England moments, Euro 96, he was in the side throughout, I think. The um, the, the one, the Free Lions song reference is... Um, it's the, Ready for War. Yeah, and, and it's from that Italy game, isn't it? Where yeah. he, he's got like a bandage on and... the. the a bandage and a, and a head cut is always a good look for a passionate yeah. England player. And, and I think I think he's kind of not remembered as being a, this a great this amazing player. But the, <clears> the early era of the Premier League, he was one of the best players in it. And I think maybe because he hasn't got those people to defend him now, it's. But again, he seemed to have been on that retirement kind of run for a long time. And there we see some England fans, some proper England fans. Yeah, some there's a couple. Uh, well, there's a there's a varying degrees of people they talk to here. So, so the port. Sorry, just to just to context again, because we've gone all over the place, really. But um, this is at Wembley ahead of the Poland game. Uh, yes, this would be ahead of the Poland game. Yeah. Yeah. So go on. Sorry. So um, it, you get to see a lot of different England fans on there, and they interview a couple of them. So um, the responses are a bit mixed. They're venturing from he has to go if we don't win tonight, and then one fan, fan saying that well, it's the Norway selection that's let him down, and you know that's why there's this animosity around it. And then we come to an England fan who is probably the most chilled out man I've ever seen interviewed with face paint on. That they're, they're all they've all sorry they've all got. England hats or, or or face paint, as you say. Yeah, he's he looks like he's ready to sort of go off on a rant or ask you if you've got any drugs that he can uh, that he can use. Um, but yeah, he's very chilled about it all, and he's quite measured and, and and makes a good point, really. Yeah, he just he's very softly spoken. Um, again, it's just so weird to see with this kind of like St George's cross literally all over his face, like Heath Ledger. Um, and he says, no matter what, the press um, would delve into his private life and destroy him as they do with everybody else. And you just think, wow, that's like a... You just, I just didn't expect to hear it from him, really. He's a, he's a lovely bloke. He's, he's yeah, a really lovely bloke. Very, very chilled and nice. You'd like to uh, just sit next to him at an England game, wouldn't you? Should we go into the Poland game? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a comfortable win for England in the end. Um, but again, comes with its own problems. If it could go wrong, it went wrong for Taylor. So, Well, well let's just... Um... First, what something I found interesting, David Seaman in goal. Yeah, I think it's the first time maybe we've seen David Seaman in this. I think he's been in the background for the documentary, but and I think the the boot man says, "Oh, I'm putting David Seaman's uh, boots out here. I usually put them under the number 13, so it must be his first time." Yeah, uh, he'd go on to be. Oh, I wouldn't say an England legend as such, but a uh, very very good keeper throughout the 90s, really. Yeah, for England. Oh, yeah, he he just. Unfortunately, letting that goal against Ronaldinho as well. I, I always, maybe it was just because I was young and, and felt like that there were there were perhaps better options just from younger players. But I was I was always like, oh bloody David Seaman. But looking back as an adult, yeah, he was so good. I mean, God, what what a keeper and a, a big bloke. And you you, you miss you miss that. With I, I've sometimes have moments I'm like, God, Jordan Pickford's our keeper, and he's he's, he's a small bloke. You know, <laughs> I loved. I've said it a couple of times now, but. One of my favourite England players, Jordan Pickford. But um, yeah, Seaman's in the squad and it's a comfortable win in the end. But as you say, it does come with its problems and there's some great comic timing stuff as well. In that final third, today, I'm going to be quite nice to you. 
But tomorrow I'm going to fucking kick you up the arse. Yeah, so what's he trying to get from Les with, with saying that? I think he's trying to say, because he's in training with him, and he's saying, well, maybe, you know, I'm going to be nice to you today, big you up and everything, but when you're on the pitch tomorrow, I'm going to be on you because you've got to be at the game, you've got to be at the races, and you've got to be scoring, and you've got to be, you know, putting yourself around, which he, which he does, clearly, in five minutes in, he scores. So. And, it, and it works. Wow. And it works, yeah. Taylor's motivated him. So has he, has he found a golden touch? He just needs this, like, direct approach to talk to players and give them specific instructions. Well, you get into into cut here is you get three moments in training that lead to three things that come on the pitch. So he also says to Paul Gascoigne, I want you to hurt them. No, he's not found a golden touch. Mm. That's not a good thing to say. No, so it goes straight through a Poland player with a late tackle and he's booked. And what does that mean? It means that he misses the Netherlands game, which is up next. Oh, dear. Why use that phrase around Paul Gascoigne? You know it's going to go wrong because it's unfortunate at this point it's it's Graham Taylor and Paul Gascoigne talking. Yeah, <laughs> I want you to hurt them. I know and, why and he use that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not thought through. Um, it's not... Playing to his strengths over. So you want him on the ball. And but what he's, I think what he's trying to say, which actually does come through, is Gaza goes through, he makes it 2-0, and Taylor just looks furious because he said, I want you to hurt them, as in, I want you to hurt them on the pitch. I want you to like go oh, at yeah, them. Yeah. So that's where you think, all right, well, maybe he's got a bit of a touch there and he's doing it. But it's a, it's already been undermined by the fact that Gaza's on a yellow card, got a yellow card, and that's him out of the game now. Well, there's also um, the, the third of those direct, you know, you, you see it in training and then you see it on the pitch is uh, a free kick. Yeah, so it's an interesting spot about free kicks. Uh, so Taylor and Gascoigne are talking and they're talking about maybe having an indirect free kick and having a touch and moving it to the side. And Taylor says, I don't mind. I don't mind if it's been you know, an indirect free kick. But the way they're talking about it is if it's like the first time that they've come up with it. Yeah. It's like the first time it's been mentioned and tried out. So immediately cuts back to the game. The ball's moved, it's stopped, and Stuart Pearce smashes it into the top corner, 3-0, and the game's won, really. Yeah, there's a there's a, a comment I love um, from Taylor at the end, very sort of salty, um, the, the, saying basically, what do you think of the game? He goes, well, people have been wanting Gaza not to play, now they'll get a chance because he's suspended. Oh, so bitchy, that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's like, well, you got your wish, you dickheads. <laughs> um, yeah, we've said we've said um, maybe the team would be better off without him. Um I guess I guess it's not the case, but we've got a lot to to get through before we get to the um, the Rotterdam, uh, sorry, the Holland yeah, game. Yeah. So this is a, a scene with the FA now. Uh, he has a meeting with the FA. Uh, probably the last thing he would want, he, <laughs> although he did just get a win. Yeah. So yeah. it's not a bad time. What the hell? What what is the point of this room of people that just like? I get that he's the England manager and he has to be appointed and he has to be accountable and there has to be a leadership structure. But what is what are they doing? I mean, it's just a load of old blokes just just kind of like passing comment passing on kind comment. Of what's happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what did you take from this scene? It's just very strange because clearly this this was a meeting that's been arranged, I think, in advance where they're going right. World Cup qualification should be nearly done by now. Let's let's you know talk about your new contract, and they do talk about kind of that. The World Cup's going to happen. There's a couple of times they mention about going to America and we talk about it afterwards. And this is the biggest game of the tournament, like qualifying rounds coming up now. And they're all, I talk about maybe a new deal and things like that. And it's, it's just really weird. And they're talking about levels of coaching and, oh, maybe this will succeed this chairman. It's just like, why is this in here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did, I did find that little bit interesting when it, it's Charles Hughes, FA Director of Coaching, talks yeah. about renovating the coaching system. I think that's working now, but they didn't actually do it here when he's suggesting, did they? No. I mean, it's taken, I, I put, I think, post-McLaren, because isn't isn't there a story that there's a, a countdown timer in one of the FA, like, big offices that leads to, like, when the, the Qatar World Cup final will end? And oh, that's okay. been there for years, 
and it's counting down to it's like when we're going to win the World Cup. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really sure I've not made that up. But uh, apparently that's been there for like, I'm talking eight or nine years. I think it's because they've targeted it for so long in yeah. terms of, well, this is when, I think it must have come from 2010 maybe, because yeah. I remember there being a big thing about, you know, we've got to scrap everything, start again. and That we, was always the way, wasn't it? It felt like that was just on loop for, for yeah. every couple of years. But yeah, yeah. Um, he then goes to Birmingham. <laughs> hey, <laughs> just what he needs. Come on, Graham, come to Birmingham. He's gone to uh, BBC Studios in Birmingham. Uh, is he doing? Is he doing a bit of press, like TV press or something? I think yeah. so. I think he's going to be on a TV program, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I, I don't know who it is that he's. Graham Norton. Is um, Graham Norton? Well, maybe slightly early for Graham <laughs> Norton. But he's, at, he's at Pebble Mill being interviewed about something, and there's another guest on with him as well, and they're kind of having a bit of awkward joking between each other and. And Taylor says, oh, I get letters from Princess Diana saying thank you for taking me off the headlines. And um, It's a good line. It's a good line, but then it's undermined by whoever it is next to him that says, uh, well, she's never had a, a turnip on top of her head, has she, though? Yeah, it's like, don't say turnip around him. <laughs> We've got through the whole documentary yeah. without saying turnip, and it's yeah. just like, what well, is he, this? He walks out, and he's got a bit of confidence about him, I feel. He's going like, oh, yeah, so... They're like, what, what you got? What's up next? And he's gone. Well, probably just talk about getting a new contract with the yeah, FA. And he's yeah. like, you, you're not getting a new contract. No, that contract would have come up in that meeting with all those blokes, wouldn't it? <laughs> he was like, he was probably thinking, I was expecting them to talk about a contract, and it never came up. I should have. Weird, that isn't it? Yeah. So now, oh, this this is where the film really approaches boiling point. We, we're kind of in the last stretch of the movie, the movie, the film, whatever, the documentary. Um, press conference in Rotterdam ahead of the uh, Holland game, mm -hmm. and this is fantastic. Yeah, so there's a lot of negativity in the press leading up to it. Um, again, they're bringing up the Norway team and the selection. Uh, it says that he's going to a back four still. But he's saying, that, oh, well, I've had three changes in forced on me here, so this must be like Ince and a couple of, no, sorry, um, Gascoigne and a couple of injuries around that. And and he kind of comes out fighting. I think this is the best he looks at the whole documentary. Hundred percent. I, I think he looks fantastic at this point because he's saying, "Well, the press wanted Merson to play, and now he is. You're not happy." Others saying that we shouldn't be playing Ian Wright because he's only scored one goal, but he's got us a goal that's really important. And he pretty much just derises a couple of um, journalists. One for like misquoting about the, "Oh, well, I wouldn't make any changes from this game, but I've had to make three and. Yeah, it's just very, very strange, isn't it? I love it. Um, it it's, it's, oh, I'm just going to say it's very, this is the England will play 4 4 fucking 2, yeah, Mike it Bassett, is, yeah. uh, in real life. He's, he says stuff like, he's like, come on, rise yourself. He's talking to the journalists and going, why are you guys being so flipping negative about the team? Like, we can win. Why don't you just, like, why do you have to be on everyone's back all the time to the point where I think he says to one of them, I can't even listen to you anymore. Yeah. You know, he, he, he says, Rob, I can't have faces like yours about me, about me. If you're one of my players, I kick you out. Well, that's it. He's just, I get it. He's trying to will it into existence, isn't he? At this point, he hasn't really, he, he won the Poland game. So things yeah. could be worse and he's building, he's got positivity from that. But at the same time, he knows he's got to he's got to pull a rabbit out of that Holland, and it, and it's as you say, it's the bigger occasion. I mean, would he have been more respected maybe if he'd have been like this all the time? If he'd have been a bit of a, a tyrant and biting back at the press? Because maybe he did, maybe. But, but we don't. It's not. They seem to. Like they that. seem to enjoy it. It's, it's it's a bit of a laddie atmosphere in that press room. A lot of I don't know whether like a lot of them were just on the piss all the time and you know because that's a journalistic thing from back in the days and it just like a couple of pints in the afternoon and a couple after work and i don't know i don't know whether they were all just seeing it as a joke and they were just like we're just here to just wait for you to be sacked really now well there's quite a famous thing about when um, kevin keegan was appointed and apparently in the press conference as you know his first opening press conference um a very very senior uh, journalist turned to another and said right let's get him gone in six months so it just shows that there is this thing about well, if you if you, your face doesn't fit, we don't like you. That's gone now, and uh, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know if that's still a thing. Really, like I there seems to be is. characters in this dressing room, in, dressing room in this press conference here. Yeah, I don't know if that's still. I mean, maybe because just we're not on the other side and we don't get this kind of footage. But I don't see that now. Maybe that's changed a bit because of twenty eighteen and way Southgate changed the, me the relationship with the media of being as open as possible to a point. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I was thinking about that point, but I also think if England would have failed at the tw 2018 World Cup, everyone would have just gone, 
why did you just let all these players, like, couldn't you have done that in a more, why did you have to open them all up to the media? Why couldn't you just have your captains? But there weren't, there were no expectations at that point of that nah. World Cup, was there? I mean, so. with all, as, as good as Taylor does here, and I think he comes out fighting really well, it, to me, it's, it's undermined slightly because when he says the line about, oh, you know, if you were one of my players, I'd kick you out. Yeah. Ince whispers something to Paul Merson and they're both smiling in the yeah, background. Yeah. It's a bit like, well, would he? Because actually, he it's wouldn't actually, have this. It's actually really annoying because, like, this is, it's still entirely possible that England can do it. It's a big game against, against. And um, they only need a draw as well. I didn't even know that. So, yeah. They only need, they only need a draw. So, because they go to San Marino, you'd imagine they'll be at San Marino. So, you know, there's a, there's a chance here because if that doesn't happen, then. They're still in it, really. They've got to go to the Netherlands and they've got to get a, a point, basically. So uh, David Seaman continues in goal. So we were kind of right there. A lot of um, this is a, quite a different lineup to what he's put out. So David Seaman, Paul Parker, Tony Dorigo, Carlton Palmer, Tony Adams, Gary Pallister, David Platt, captain. Wasn't he just taken off him? But Pierce, I think, must have been. I mean, how has Pierce got banned in this period of time, or he's been injured again? So it's all all that talk about. Oh, you know, we take it off Platty and give it to. Um, it's it's back with it's David Black now. Which is why don't why give it to him at this point? Paul Merson's get gets a start. Uh, Shearer's back. Mm -hmm. Lee Sharp and Paul Ince is back as well. Right. So this is a huge game, and uh, I think Taylor gives a, a, a measured, not measured, mm -hmm. sorry, a speech that's passionate enough for the occasion. Really yeah. good. I think it's a proper leadership moment. I, I, I think he says it because it's something about you know, grabbing moments in life because you don't get many of them and this is your chance to go and grab your moment. I, I think, again, this little period of Taylor is, he does so well here. I think we're going to have to clip quite a lot of audio from this section, so we'll put that clip. One place in the United States. Are we all in here now? Okay, just 30 seconds now. In life, there's so many opportunities and they're all around about. There's too many people in life that never see them. And then there are those people who see the opportunities and they don't want to grasp it. And then there's the other people that generally are life's winners. They see the opportunities, they go looking for them, and when they see them, they grasp them. And that's what you're facing now on the football field, isn't it? Go fucking take the opportunity, it's there for you, and wring every little bit out of it, okay? And, yeah, England start well, um, mm. by the looks of things. Merson, who has seemed a coach in the dressing room, but we haven't really seen him on the pitch. Um, he, he he looks dangerous. Yeah, he's, he's kind of running through the Netherlands side. England hit the post and, and nearly scored twice as well. And they start really well. And again, on the side of the pitch, you see Taylor really animated into the game, shouting, talking throughout. And yeah, it's it's kind of brought down a little bit. Rijkaard has a, a goal disallowed for offside, which apparently on the TV afterwards, it's it's quite debatable whether it was or not. But we get through to half time, and it you know, seems quite equal. And you know they've got the result they need so far. And, yeah. And and then something quite strange happens. So Taylor changes it at half time, and he brings on Andy Sinton for Carlton Palmer, seemingly changing the system. I mean, from my understanding, Carlton Palmer has been playing in the middle, which is where Taylor's wanted him for quite a while. Yeah. Andy Sinton's a wide player, so I don't really know what they what they've shifted to here. I mean, if he's got David Platt, who he's already said he doesn't want in the center of the pitch. I, you know, and I don't really know what else is happening. Paul Merson's playing in there, I'm guessing. It's a strange one, isn't it? Especially I mean, Paul, it... Paul, Ince, Paul Ince is in there, so he's got someone there with him. But um, he's one of Platt and or um, Paul Merson's got to play there. It doesn't seem natural, especially when you've had. Maybe you know, maybe Palmer was injured, but it didn't seem like it. Maybe um, watching this game through the lens of the documentary doesn't allow us to grasp the intricacies of it so yeah you might have been watching if you watch the full game you might go oh god he needs he needs to to, to come off and maybe he wouldn't bring on maybe that's a one to watch for another day it's, it's, I, I think this game's a definitely one so so you know in terms of what happens on the pitch we'll kind of gloss over it because there's a lot of other um there's a lot of other things that happen off the pitch which are really interesting in this one so. well just before we do get to that um in in uh, gets injured right yeah so he, he looks like he's picked up an injury and taylor's talking about yeah, maybe taking him off and what he could do if he's the holding player and and who does he turn to? Des, Des Walker. Walker. Yeah, and it, it's it's a bit sad because the way he goes over is almost like quite apologetic. Yeah, he's like, look, man, I, 
I know that we've uh, we've had our differences, but can you help me? It's, basically, it's like he's, and this is no way kind of like to degrade like Des Walker and his behaviour in this documentary because we don't really see anything of it. But he kind of goes over to him like like a child that doesn't want to do something. It's like he want, doesn't want to go to the dentist. It's like, well, if you if you come with me, yeah, if you, and, if, and if you can <laughs> sit in midfield for me, that that would just be really help us out here. I think you can do that, Des. But again, like Des Walker's a centre half, so he's kind of asking him to play out a position as well. So, right, and now we get to the absolute chaos. That's it. That's good enough. Go on, Platy. Let's go, Ray. Let's go, Ray. Should be sent off. Should be sent off as well. Is he going to send him off? He's going to send him off. So David Platt is through on goal. Yeah. Right. To me, and and I think to everybody, he's dragged down by Ronald Koeman. That is a red card. I I I could not believe that it wasn't given as a red card. Yeah. It, it's it's ridiculous, and he's he's clearly on the wrong side of him, and he grabs the back of his shirt, hauls him down. It's just outside the area, which is fine. You're going to give a free kick there, but he has to go, and Taylor loses it. Right. Well, I mean, it's proper pantomime from Taylor, waving his arms, looking behind him, doing double takes. It's it's like he's like dressed as a dame or something, like he, in a pantomime. It's just all over the place. He's so angry, he becomes William Shakespeare. What have you been instructed? What's the, what sort of thing is happening here? You know the, the rules, hey? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. It's, 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 he's so angry. He is so angry because it, it he can sense it being dragged away from him. He's like, nothing in this entire shit show of a qualifying campaign has ever gone right for me. And this is where I need it to go right. And it's just going to blow up in my face. So we come to the free kick. So there's a free kick for England on the edge of the area. And they take it. And a Dutch player comes, closes it down from five yards. And the ball's cleared away. You know, pretty irrelevant. You wouldn't even think that's a thing. But... That comes back later. So <laughs> Taylor just cannot help himself at this point, but shout at the linesman. And it's not the linesman that's given it because he's clearly given the foul. It's the referee's decision. It's before VAR. Maybe they've got the earpieces in. But in reality, I, that's the ref's decision. It's just, it's, he's ref by proxy, isn't he? Yeah, he absolutely He wants is. to shout at the ref, but the linesman's there. <laughs> what has he been instructed, that linesman? Oh, no. uh, England, um, yeah, so the Dutch are obviously getting into the mood for the game now. They're taking the game to England. Uh, England give away a free kick right In on the edge of the box. Identical situation almost. Yeah. It, it's not like, I think it's Paul Ince maybe commits a foul on the edge of the area. He's booked. It's not like the same situation where Koeman's, pulled him down, but it's in the exact same spot pretty much at the other end of the pitch. So they've got the same chance that we had, where it would just hit, hit the defender, yeah. but we hit the defender from five yards away, whatever. Just something that happens here as well. They cut to a fan and it cuts to a Dutch fan. He's wearing a hat. He's wearing sunglasses. He's got a red card in his hand. And you think, <laughs> what's, where's this? Oh, he's in blackface as well. Oh no. Yep. So you just think you've, you've got dressed up with all that. You've bought your red card at home and you think that's the thing to do. Why? Yeah, well, why were you showing that still? Why is the camera showing that? Well, I can't answer that question. No. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, just madness. What? What? Why would blackface top that? Look, up? Well, I don't think we should talk about <sighs> no, it. No, it's, it's just abysmal, isn't it? But yeah. so the free kick's given, and it's Ronald Koeman. So he takes the free kick, and it's blocked by Paul Ince from probably around the same amount of distance as the Dutch yeah. player. The free kick is retaken. Because Paul Ince closed it down and he was too close. Yes, yeah, so he was too close. Uh, and Phil Neal even says it's in the same. It's the same situation. It's in the same position. Cut to Brian Moore. Again, it's Ronald Koeman. Again, the problem is there. Again, it's a critical moment. He's going to flip one now. He's going to flip one. He's going to flip one. And it's in. <laughs> 
<sighs> Just obviously, if it could go wrong for England, it yeah. goes wrong at this point, doesn't it? It's, yep. ridic it's ridiculous. It's a great free kick from Koeman. He shouldn't even be on the pitch. Yeah, and and obviously it's you almost laugh, you'd cry. It's this is this is this is England. Is this England? This is the most England thing ever. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. It's a quality free kick. I thought we were getting the same treatment in uh, the Euros against Denmark when they scored the absolute worldie in the semis, mm. uh, the free kick, and I was just like, yeah, well, that's that's brilliant, isn't it? This this is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for this kick in the guts, and here it comes. Yeah. Um. And also, just a quick word for on Ronald Koeman. Obviously, it's been spoken about what an amazing player he he was. I was I was interested to see a. Uh, free kick from him. I haven't really, I've, I've just kind of heard about them and not seen many from well, the archives. He, he goes for two different styles as well, which is really interesting. So the first one is obviously charged down and he thinks, right, well, that's, they're going to do that again. It's maybe not the best option. So what he actually does, it's a, just a lift over the wall into the next corner and to see a player just with the confidence to do that, let alone the ability to do it is fan, is just fantastic. He was a brilliant player again, a bit before my time, but you kind of, hear about him he scored something like 140 goals for a guy who's essentially a defender going into midfield mental um so england are one nil down and then a draw couldn't a draw is a good result right we've established that draws a good result so england kind of go at the other end of the pitch um paul merson hits the inside of the post from a free kick again oh. it's just all coming back but kind of the hammer blow that comes straight afterwards dennis burkamp goes up the other end and scores from a long-range goal I mean, David Seaman's beaten very easily at that near post. It just kind of like scuttles past him. Yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a shit show. And and I think Taylor even says something like, "Oh, it's, it, he's been beaten" or something similar to that. And and again, Taylor just goes into absolute overdrive here. We're obviously trying to do um, this documentary justice and analyze it, but you really have to watch. If if you were to just watch. A part I'd watch this game from yeah, it. it it's, it's incredible. The emotion is is so high, and Taylor's done now, isn't he? He yeah. knows he's done. Um, he's he's oh, he's some iconic lines again, but for all the wrong reasons, you know. He's he's resigned to it now, isn't he? You know we've been cheated, don't you? I'm a meter. I'm a meter. You know, then he doesn't take the free kick at the other end. It's all right, OK. No, no, no. Now I'm in my meter here. No, you can't. Look, look, look at him. That's two minutes. I won't say anything. I won't say anything else. Right. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. I won't say anything else now, you know. No, come on, don't. Don't. I know it isn't. That's what I'm saying. But I'm allowed to stay up a meter. Yeah. Let's have a look again. Even if he doesn't see it as a penalty, he has to go. He ha you know that. I know you know it. So, And then the fellow throws the free kick. You can't say anything. I know you can't say anything. I know that. You see, at the end of the day, I get the sack now. I'm just saying to your colleague, referee's got me the sack. Thank you ever so much for that, won't you? Yeah, he says, you know, we've been cheated, the fourth official. Um, he starts arguing with him. It's really sad as, um, as the fourth official starts arguing back, actually, and tells him to sit down. And Oh, he gets into a little mini argument about his technical area or something. Yeah, I mean, he? one yard. I mean, one yard, he says. Yeah, and, and it's it's really sad because he said, it's really sad. As Taylor quietly just says, look, last two minutes, I won't say anything. Because they're going to send him off, right? Yeah, and he's much. like, let me stand here for the last two minutes. I'm not going to move. Yeah. But yeah. he, but clearly he can't help himself. No, no. He clearly can't help himself. I know you know it. I know you can't say anything. At the end of the day, I get the sack now just because to your colleague, uh, sorry, just said to your colleague, the referee got me the sack now. Thank you very much for that. Oh, I'll tell you what, that is what a as, journey as a documentary <laughs> maker. That is just gold for them he must have been whoever put this together must have saw that and just went wow you know yeah. and and, and it, it is insane because he's not wrong he's not right either but he's he's saying it and you can hear it crystal clear and i always wonder you know how much football does um football definitely does like 
so there's lots of sliding doors doors moments, especially when it comes to refereeing decisions. And I sometimes wonder how how much managers think, look back, and go, "Oh, that bloody referee in that game, you know, he changed my life basically." Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, I, it was never going to end well for for Taylor, but um, he, I get his point. Yeah, but at the same time, they've conceded two. But but as but as well, they put themselves in this position where they needed to get a draw away at a very very good side. Yeah. So this is the problem. You've had these games in in you know where they've only scraped a draw late on. You've got the really bad game against Norway away. You've got the draws at home against the Netherlands and the, and Norway. It's out of your hands now. It deserves to be out of your hands. I know the referee made that decision there, which everyone knows night and day. But ten men, there's a chance that you can get a draw there. So, I mean, we 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 spoke about at the top of this um, the last night of qualifying for the World Cup. Um, 94 and how there were so many uh, things that could happen England can still qualify and they've got to play San Marino the worst I mean England recently in 2021 beat San Marino 10-0 I think yeah, yeah. And, and that's just the way it's always been with San Marino there's a reason why the fans were booing them when they were tuning up and it's yeah. like so they can win am I right by saying England need to win by seven goals Completely achievable, and Poland also need to get a result against the Netherlands. Yeah, I, th- I can't remember if it's a draw or it's a or it's a win that they need, but essentially they just need to get something out of the game, basically. So the scene is set. England are playing the worst side in the world, and they need to win by seven goals. The stage is set for England's last and decisive match in this uh, World Cup qualifying group. England in red, San Marino in blue. England needing to win by a seven-goal margin and hope that Poland can do them a favour in Poznan against Holland. I'm sure you're aware now of what's at stake. And Bacchocchi, number nine, picks the ball up straight away, and San Marino launched the first attack. Oh, and a mistake by Stuart Pearce, and San Marino has scored! I don't believe this! Oh, right. San Marino kickoff. <laughs> you actually couldn't write this. <laughs> San Marino kick off. Um, they go forward and play the ball down the left hand side of England. Who's there? Mr. Reliable, the man, Stuart Pearce. Is he captain? Uh, I think he is. Most he, likely, yeah. yeah he is. I mean, if Taylor's in charge at this point, he must be. Pl- um, Platt's playing, but not captain. Yeah, so Stuart Pearce, the man bought in for these big games, plays a short pass back to David Seaman, and Galtieri sneaks in to score the quickest goal in World Cup qualifying history. My God. That is the worst. Like, that is so England and so tragic and so many things, but also really funny. I mean, yeah, because this wasn't the time I was supporting England, it feels like it didn't happen to me. Yeah, And it feels like it doesn't any part of that. But my God, this is so, so grim. I I will say as well, the commentary from John Motson is really good on this bit because it feels like he's reading from a script and it's just one chain of thought the way he just breezes through it and perfectly San Marino score yeah and and the documentary pretty much ends there doesn't it am I right yeah 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 that it's it's pretty much done I think it may come up with you know I think it was six days afterwards that Graham Taylor um Graham Taylor resigns I mean that's clearly a joint decision that's made isn't it so our joint decision that we made originally was to cover the San Marino game and then we decided to cover the impossible job and just touch on the San Marino game very good idea because nothing can beat that documentary, no. um, especially not just watching England score seven goals. Who cares? But they do. And it, it's a, another, I know um, eventually um, Poland don't get the results, so it's irrelevant yeah. anyway. But the fact that England got seven, but the one they conceded was one they conceded, which means they wouldn't have done it anyway. And it was the quickest goal in World Cup qualifying history. It's just another beautiful, horrible irony. To I this. know. But you know what? I think this is, you know, for in the name of Taylor and everything, he, uh, the joy that he's brought us through this documentary, I think, you know, finishing on a high. England score seven, although they are behind for 22 minutes oh. to the worst side in the world. Do I not like that? No, I don't think any of us do. So just quickly, Ince uh, picks up the ball from distance and hits it into the bottom corner uh, to make it 1-1. The San Marino goalkeeper clears the ball, Platt shoots, Ian Wright taps in from a ricochet to make it 2-1. Uh, there's a long ball from David Platt. The keeper spills it out of his legs and Les Fernand taps in for 3-1. Um, Fernand, nice bit of play actually, down the left-hand uh, channel uh, for Ian Wright to make it four. Uh, again, Des Walker 
chips mm-hmm. the chips the ball into Fernand, uh, skips past the player and crosses for Paul Ince to tap in. Yeah, nice finish. Yeah, uh, Gary Pallister with a with a deep ball into the box. Um, uh, Fernand flicks it on for Ian Wright all alone, and he completes his hat trick. I mean. Well done, Ian Wright. Happy for Ian Wright. I know, yeah. He comes well. Obviously, Ian Wright comes across as a likable person because yeah. he just seems like an absolute legend. But um, even younger, you know, in his younger days here, and for the bits that he's in the film, yeah. does come across as a great bloke. And the last goal, Ince, uh, Ince through the midfield. It's a really, really nice reverse ball into Ian Wright to score his fourth and England seven. It's all over at this point though, because the Netherlands have already beaten Poland and. That's, yeah, that's that's the end of Taylor, really, isn't it? Well, so we'll just cover a little bit of the aftermath. Uh, we've gone very deep uh, on on this subject so far. Um, I, my my initial reaction. So we we watched uh, as well as watching the Impossible uh, Job and uh, some brief highlights of the um, San Marino. Well, I don't know game. if that game isn't available in ninety minutes. No, uh, more's a pity. <laughs> but if anyone's got links, send them <laughs> us. Um, we we watch the aftermath as well. So Taylor looks happy. I've got to say, he looks like he knows he's going to get sacked and the weight has been lifted. Yeah, That's that's my take. I could be wrong. No, I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, he says he's going to have to have a conversation with the FA. Um, the chief executive of the FA is interviewed as well. And him and Taylor seem to be in the same stairwell they're being interviewed. I um, When I watched this and made these notes, I brought myself four beers. Yeah. So the, this, is, this is fourth beer notes <laughs> at this point. And I've... Two bullet points so far for post game. Taylor looks happy in a way, like he cannot wait to be sacked. The next bullet point, fucking depressing. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just those two words. I don't know yeah. if I was commenting on my life or on the um on the on the on the situation, but yeah, who is it? The interview on the stairwell, the chief executive of the FA. Yeah, I think it's the guy that you mentioned earlier, basically. But he's kind of saying, oh well, you know, we've got to take a look at everything, and no decision's going to be made, and you know, we'll, we'll just carry on for now. And yeah, and what what else can he say? Taylor Taylor says something about comments being made in 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 self interest rather than the good for the game. I don't think either of them know what to say. They mm. both just want to get in a room and sack Graham Taylor. Yeah, like they're just like let's just do it. It'd be, it'd be fun. I'd crack a beer in that situation and I'd go, oh my god, this I'm, has gone well. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a massive holiday. I, I, I need to get going here. He needs to have he needs to have a good summer, doesn't he? Oh, please. I hope I hope he did have a good summer. Yeah. He would not have had a good summer. <laughs> uh, he's asked if it's his lowest point. He says it's a low moment, but I have the mental toughness to overcome this. Uh, it's it's interesting because he does go back to like you know the hysteria around the Netherlands game and and you know grassroots like re, you know changing everything about football and and it, it kind of brings us into there's a, there's a bit of post match in the San Marino game I find really interesting. Same, oh, yeah, I'm I'm glad you suggested for me to watch this. So we looked at a bit of the post match of this as well. So it's it's cut to the ITV studio and you've got you've got Des Lynham, you've got Jimmy Hill, you've got Terry Venables and and then just a man that nobody speaks to throughout the whole thing either. I mean I don't know who that is, but yeah, I, I think it's really interesting it's a good it's a strong lineup obviously des is a, a, prof- <laughs> a professional uh jimmy hill wants the mic he talks quite a lot and um el tell he's there very much just um Cro- oh. he's crooning isn't he almost yeah. he's kind of purring over it all he really is it's quite it's quite sick really it's like a, a cook sort yeah. of <laughs> sort of scenario could poor Poor Graham Taylor's not, you know, he's not sacked yet. No. But um, they're talking like he's already gone. I mean, the build up for the game must have been as well. He's pretty much already gone because we don't think the Netherlands well, are going to get a result in Poland. Yeah, we, we don't know if there was a big gap in between the two games. I can't. I don't, I don't think there was. I think it pretty much went, there's like big games to play now, and it went straight into it. Yeah, so Jimmy Hill says. Um, something about the amount of cultured players that England have and the need more cultured players. So. Yeah. He's pinning it more. I actually think that they don't. They don't. Other than Tell El Tell, who's there, as we say, purring. I don't think they're piling on Taylor too much. No, I, I think it's a, the, the kind of like the players are to blame, or, or just it's just one of those things. I think it's almost like the system they're talking about. Jimmy Hill says that they don't produce enough cultured players. To me, that that's him saying we haven't got the players to do it. But he also says, you know, kind of kind of similar to what I'd said about well, actually, you go back to Italia ninety. And it was a dire group stage. It was, you know, a win against the last minute against Belgium in extra time. And it was beating Cameroon, who weren't a very good side, but playing well against Germany. So he's kind of down that route as well of, well, Italian 90 was a bit of a 
false dawn and not not yeah. really this you know great thing and Nick, Nick hates Italia 90 clearly <laughs> well we gotta do some Italia 90 <laughs> um, yeah it, it, it does kind of there's, there's a little spat isn't there Venables and Jimmy Hill um, it's, it kind of accuses him of not looking after young English players at Spurs while yeah. he's Spurs manager yeah it's, it's, a, weird, it's a weird atmosphere it's, it's interesting because they're all they're all kind of speaking from the hearts uh, Lionel asks Venables if he if he um, was offered the job would, would he take it yeah uh, he says uh, it's not as sought after as it once was, so I'm going to sit on the fence. But very cheekily with it, he's like, "Oh, I'm going to sit on the fence. Give yeah. me, a, give me a call, mate." And, uh, and, it, and it's and it's very much kind of it ends with almost the you know Taylor resigns six days after the San Marino. Taylor game. resigns, yeah, yeah. So, but again, it's like that must be a joint thing about mm, is it resign or is it an agreement kind of? Yeah, of course, of course. And then Venables takes over for Euro '96. Of course, he does. He want he he was. He was desperate. I, I, bet, I, I bet he paid ITV or BBC to get him on that um, analysis desk after the game. Yeah. Just be like, I need I need people to be seeing me after that shit show. Well, well it's, it's interesting as well. He says um, the job when it was available to Taylor was very interesting to a lot of people and they were, very, they were very intelligent people. But he says, if anybody's got the intelligence now, it's not as interesting as it once was. So he's kind of saying, I'm no, yeah, no, just kind of like nobody else take this job because if you've got any sense, you won't take this because uh, it's, it's a big thing. But in reality, he takes the job. He's, so a, he's likeable, kind of like he's a likeable man, up. though, isn't he, Venables, right? I, th I think so, yeah. He's not, you know, he's, he did a lot of, in club football, obviously, in kind of the 80s and the 90s, he, he, he left Spurs under kind of strange circumstances. It was one of the reasons, by the sound of it, of why he didn't get the job over Taylor was because he kind of had a few skeletons in his closet, apparently. He just didn't, the FA didn't really like him. Because and... I feel like I watched this and then I kind of took a slight dislike to him, but it's just because I'd become so attached to Graham Taylor. I felt yeah. so sorry for him. I didn't like the idea of this guy lording it up. and uh, so basically... someone beating up your dad or something, isn't it? It's just, <laughs> oh, leave him alone. <laughs> So Nick, that was a big one. Was yeah. was it England? Is this is this England? It was so England, wasn't it? This is just I mean This is it, the textbook. But this is England we'll never see again. We won't see a side in terms of a behind you know the, the scenes documentary no. about this kind of thing. And even wanting to have this kind of access is just like yeah. what was the best that was gonna come out of this? Yeah, I would I would love to hear a bit and maybe I could have done some research beforehand, but why would you bother doing that? No. Um just about why the documentary was made and what the hopes were for it. Um, yeah, so definitely, is this England? Yes. I mean, it's it's the textbook, every element. It's it's the template for Mike Bassett, which is England. Um, what's next, Nick? So, I've got something here which I think you're going to quite enjoy. Okay. We're going to play a game. Oh, uh, yes, I love a game. So, this is called Bassett's All Sorts. Okay, okay, go on then. So, oh, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Bassett's All Sorts. I'm trying to think what this could be. Is... Is it a quiz or is it more like a word association game? So what it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be, I'm going to read you out some quotes. You're going to have to tell me if it's from The Impossible Job or it's from Mike Bassett. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just tying my lace. I love that as a concept. I think I'm going to smash it. Okay, you ready for this then? Yeah. We've got, well, we had eight quotes, but I know you've used one of them already. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave that one out. Number one, in some respects, that's a fair comment. In others, I totally disagree. I don't think I'm going to smash it anymore. Mike Bassett? Hey, three cheers for Ramirez. Yes, come on. Brilliant. Number two, staying in football management over a long period of time, you invariably win more than you use. And you lose. I don't know. I'm going to say, Taylor, impossible job. Hey, three cheers for Ramirez. Correct. Yes. I do love the Mike Bassett film, though, so I, I, it's like a process of elimination. Okay. Number three. Yep. Let's do it. Two, two out of two so yeah. far. Things to be successful as an England manager, asked. Uh, well, there's A, you've got to pick the best players. B, you've got to motivate them. C, you've got to use the right tactics. And D, which is probably the most important of all, you've got to have some luck. Mike Bassett. Hey. Correct. I was trying to jump on that and finish the sentence for you, and, and it was that bit when he goes, D, and what I think is most important, it was going to be there. Yeah. Nice one. Full mark so far. Can you get all the way? I know, yeah. We, well, this this will take me to halfway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when asked if they could win an upcoming game, he said, I don't want to predict that. Obviously, I want them to win, but I can't say if they will or not. 
What do you think? You're asking me the, to predict White the bassist. future. <laughs> well done. Yes. Come on. Hey, three cheers for Ramirez. I'm going I'm to get the clean sweep. There yeah, we go. Question five. Uh, yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, you've got to be mentally tough in this job, and I can well understand how national managers are brought down. I don't intend for that to happen to me. Um, impossible job. Hey, three cheers for Ramirez. Yes, you looked at me like I've got it wrong then. Oh. Uh, this is the first time in my professional career I haven't achieved what I set out to do. Impossible job. Hey, three cheers for Ramirez. Correct. Yes. What are we on now? Six. Uh, yes. Two more. They said it was an impossible job for me to get yeah. all eight. Uh, I've always said, if you're old enough, you're, you're good, good enough. enough. Mike Bassett. Yes, last one then. <laughs> Here we go. We invented football. We gave it to the world and we're going to go out there and I'm going to bring it back. Mike Bassett. Correct. Yes! <laughs> hey, three cheers for Ramirez. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. hip, hip. Shut up! Some of those were tricky. Some of those were good for me. It, they said it was an impossible job, but I got all eight. Thank you. I'll prepare something nice for you next time because I love a good quiz. Real job. Any, anywho, should we say our goodbyes? Yes, thanks very much, mate. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much. Take care. See you all soon. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at isvis underscore England. If you have any questions, suggestions, or any uh, hot takes to share with us, you can email us at isvisenglandpod at gmail.com.